Hello everybody, this is Georgianne Hughes and this is The Bite Show. And as promised, here <laughs> is Joseph Farrell and Scott DeHart and we're going to be talking about their new book, Humanism. And Transhumanism. Transhumanism. Yes. <laughs> oh boy, thank you, Joseph. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, what do you actually mean by the word transhumanism? Oh, which one of us do you want to take that one? <laughs> Jump in, anybody. Why don't you take that, Joseph, with the grin? All right. Well, um, George Ann, what we mean by it is kind of revealed by the subtitle, which we call the Grimoire of Alchemical Agendas. Okay. And if you kind of parse that subtitle, a Grimoire, of course, is, is a magician's book of spells or yes. recipes, so to speak. So in other words, what, what we wrote here was, was kind of a recipe book. And then to refer to it as being alchemical, well, that's what it is. Yeah. Because if you look at what transhumanists are talking about, what they what they want to accomplish, we kind of laid it out. We we debated uh, Scott and I a long time about how to lay out this book because we didn't. You know, there's a lot about transhumanism that that we find very disturbing. Oh yeah. <laughs> but we didn't want to, you know, just write a book that does nothing but condemn it. We wanted to figure out a strategy on how to approach it and discuss it that would allow people to make up their own mind. Well, it turns out, if you look at the way the book is written, we really discovered that it's nothing but alchemy, updated with modern technology. But, but the goals of transhumanism is nothing but alchemy. Because alchemy, if you, if you refer to the descent of man or the fall of man in esoteric literature or within alchemy, you have a four-staged descent. And at the very top of, of the ladder, you have mankind being viewed as, as a kind of androgyny. Yeah. And then it falls apart, it begins to fall apart into the sexes and so on. At the next stage of the ladder, you have mineral man, which may sound contradictory, but it's, it's to the point that we're asking about transhumanism here. Then you have vegetable man, and then finally you have animal man, all right? Now, if you look at that sequence, mineral, vegetable, animal, that more or less is the basic cosmology that we're taught to this day. You know, first we have the Big Bang, then we have emerged the, the elements, and then much, much later we have plant life, and then finally we have animal life, right? Yeah. So in other words, the esoteric agenda, while it sounds strange, really isn't when you compare it to modern cosmology. Well, transhumanists are trying, just like alchemists, to reverse engineer that whole process. So they talk, uh, Scott mentioned the Grin technologies, and that's genetics, robotics, uh, information, process, yeah, information processing technology, and, and uh, nanotechnology. And if you look at those four technologies, there you have, right there, contained in that, the alchemical process of reverse engineering. You're, you're playing around with genetics, with plants and animals, but there's some transhumanists that want to make a mineral man by fusing humans with computer chips and, and computers directly. And of course, some already are doing this. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So that's basically what how we're looking at transhumanism, George Ann. We're looking at it as an alchemical agenda, just like the subtitle says. Okay. Well, being that it's alchemical, what what do you mean um, mineral man and that scenario? What is that? Well, we we take the 
symbolism of, of androgyny that you find so much within esoteric literature. And we interpret it to mean any form of fusion that looks unusual. In other words, man and machine, man and mineral in that case. And quite literally, George Ann, what they're trying to do is come up with computer chips and so on and so forth that they can interface directly with the brain. And this is why we spend a lot of time in the book talking about them now growing computer chips with with neuron cells from yes. brains. Uh, they have been successful in downloading and uploading a rat's memory mm -hmm. into, a, into a completely different rat by means of computer chips. Oh. So in other words, transhumanists are, are talking about mineral man in the sense of these fusions of, of man and machine. And quite literally, that's man and mineral. Wow. <laughs> well, I know that uh, British Northern Telecom mm -hmm. was working on something they call the Soul Catcher. Yeah. And it is a chip that does pretty much what you're describing. Yep. And this was years ago. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is this is all part of this is all part of the transhumanist agenda. They they want to quite literally uh, what Scott and I found also was they're talking about the extension of human consciousness throughout the universe. So in other words, they also speak in uh, apocalyptic terms. Wow. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and it, it also, for for us, when we began toying with the, the idea, um, one of the key things for us was our background with theology right. and joining that to um, various types of teachings that have come out um, from the various religions around the world, and we, we were looking at commonalities between the ancient stories, which we've covered in other books, but that was for us something we have talked about for a very long time. Why do we have these recurring images mm -hmm. across various religions, cultures, worldwide, but the most ancient stories seem to carry the same elements in it and from there, we had the same uh, view that there's also a general fall that is aligned in the various larger religions, and it is a fall from a higher to a lower, lower order. Yeah. And, and the, the key thing, and this generally ties into to a lot of Joseph's work, um, is this idea of are there distinctions, are there divisions? That mm -hmm. came for us from the, the ancient view of a unified kind of androgynous god to a creation that resembled it, to then why is there a division, why is there a splitting, a dividing across mm -hmm. the religions, and why is that tied to a fall moment, and why is man always trying to rise back up to kind of elevate and reunify? That was almost what set the, the book into motion, was just the same discussions we've had for 20 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. 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 That's the other thing, George Ann. What, what we're getting at here, too, to a certain extent, is that this alchemical agenda in transhumanism is really literally trying to reverse engineer the fall, to undo it. Howsoever you interpret that fall, you know, it's not, wow. it's, as Scott pointed out, it's not a unique thing to Christianity or Judaism. There are other versions in it in almost every religion. Yeah. So if you look at, if you look at what we would, you know, perhaps call the deep structure of, of fall myths, or of, uh, as we also like to call it, Tower of Babel myths. Yes. Yeah. What they all have in common is the splitting, as, as Scott pointed out, of some sort of primordial unity of mankind, and for that matter, of, of the universe. So what they're trying to do, it looks to us, is the classic alchemical agenda of reverse engineering the whole process of that fall to stitch back together the distinctions that became divisions. So, you know, this this is why we spend a lot of time right at 
right up front in the book talking about that issue so that it puts the rest of the book into a huge cosmological perspective. Because if you read transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil or even uh, Joel Garreau, who is reported on the movement, if you read people like that, they're, they're very blunt that their whole agenda is quite literally the, the extension of human consciousness throughout the universe. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's, a pretty, that's a pretty tall order when you get right down to it. Well, why, what, my gosh, to reverse the fall. Right. Good grief. <laughs> they would have to start off with a totally new human. Well, bingo. Bingo. This this is what Scott and I ran into. I, I mean, and we should point out something, George Ann. One of the biggest things that we think got this movement going, there's a whole chapter in the book about 19th century literature, and in particular Percy Shelley and, yeah. and Oscar Wilde, who... As far as we're, you know, I should let Scott talk about that and shut up, but, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, they are the first real public announcers of this agenda. And, and I'll let Scott take it from there yeah. because, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, what, um, what set that into motion? Uh, <laughs> like every, every discussion we have is somehow brought back to a, a singular moment. Uh, what brought that conversation around is um, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last few years connecting thoughts between 19th century authors, particularly those who are interested in religion, philosophy, esoteric ideas. And the more that those began to work within me, I began to share those with Joseph, particularly readings within Oscar Wilde, which, not much of a surprise, was something that, without him discussing it with me, was of interest to him, and he had been digging through, and those connections for us moved from, have you ever noticed the alchemical elements within Dorian Gray? Oh, boy. That, <laughs> yeah. that kind of set into motion the, well, of course, there, there are very specific instances where it seems that it's describing nothing but an alchemical moment. Um, right. uh, I'll quote one, uh, one part from Dorian Gray that stood out to both of us. Um, and it reads, if we lived long enough to see the results of our actions, it may be that those whom the world calls evil were stirred by a noble joy. Each little thing that we do passes into the great machine of life which may grind our virtues to powder and make them worthless or transform our sins into elements of a new civilization, more marvelous and more splendid than anything that has gone before. Well, that for us was, was just far too much to even begin to ignore, not to mention the entire 11th chapter yeah. what follows it. But what runs well, through the, the... Go ahead. Well, you know, you know when, when Scott showed that, to me, George Ann, I thought, you know, we have to, we have to talk about this because, you know, as you know, George Ann, the grinding to powder, that's an alchemical reference yeah. right there because yeah. powder is the philosopher's stone. Yeah. And, you know, the whole idea of life as a machine and transforming evil into good and, and all of this, this, this whole emphasis on transformation, this is just shot through over and over, so we had to do it. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Scott. I just... <laughs> Wanted to, I wanted to share why that just leapt out at me. Well, it, when we when we began unpacking the the alchemy within Dorian Gray, the, even the just the, the simplest concept of the transference of of life to something that is immaterial, a a soul moving within to a painting, and the transformation which is taking place with that, as well as the one mm -hmm. taking place through kind of the incantation wish of Dorian brought on by the kind of the overseen hand of Lord Henry. It, it would seem, well, you're stretching it, you're stretching it, and powders, virtue, new civilization. But then when you get to chapter 11 in the book, it outlines gemstones, altars, vestments, mm -hmm. 
astronomy, mm. mysticism, South American Native instruments. Um, it, it unpacks all of these elements you would have in some type of a ritual for transformation of a society right. or of an individual to create a new society, which is clearly what Lord Henry was after. Well, okay, so maybe it's just a novel. But if you leave it at that, you also have to ignore the fact that Oscar Wilde was a devout mason at one point in his life. Yeah. So devout that he overspent his money and was in trouble with the University of Oxford for how he misspent his money, which was all on Masonic uh, accoutrements. Mm -hmm. Added to that, he was a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn. <laughs> it, it, it began to, to say to us, no, this is not just somebody who's, who's writing these gentle things. He, his, his interest in his other readings became for us a key that he knew what he was writing about. He knew why he was writing it. Yes. And he was filling in his ideas because, as he thought, the goal was to rewrite history and right. also to present a new man into civilization. Right. Which the in other words, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in other words, George Ann, you know, we're sitting there talking about, you know, Oscar Wilde and, and Dorian Gray, and we just we just came to the conclusion that this book screams, you know, that it's the first transhumanist novel in a oh certain way. Oh my! Uh, because it's announcing all these themes and and doing so with all of that baroque elegance that that you think of when you think of Oscar Wilde. Yes. And, um, you know, that did it, you know, for both of us, I think, was was that 11th chapter in, in Dorian Gray. What about Thomas Aquinas? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just jumped into it deep right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we, <laughs> we haven't even, we haven't even gotten around to Percy Shelley yet, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> in a nutshell, we, you know, when we when we started looking at Oscar Wilde, then then Scott thought, well, you know, we ought to look at uh, Percy Shelley, and you know that's true. And and then yeah. we got thinking, well, we we better go back and look at Dante. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you know, because because Dante is, and, and I'm getting to your Aquinas question, but Dante is usually thought by literary critics in academia as being heavily inspired and guided by Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll let Scott talk about Dante because I don't even <laughs> I don't want to even go there. <laughs> but <laughs> what we found, what we discovered about Dante was just, you know, mind mind splitting. But but Aquinas the interesting thing about him, George Ann, the reason we put him in this book was because, as most people know, at the end of his life, after having spent so much of it writing and, and debating about theological topics, I mean my word, the man poured out two massive theological works. Yeah a huge volume of biblical commentary, a huge volume of philosophical commentary on Aristotle. Yeah. And then all of a sudden at the end of it, toward the end of his life, he just quit. Oh. And the reason he quit is he claimed he he let it kind of be known that he had had some kind of vision, all right? Mm -hmm. But all he would ever say officially to his brothers in the Dominican order was that Everything that he had written seemed as so much straw yes. after the things that had been revealed to him. Well, there's a pious Christian explanation for what happened, and then we think there's the reality. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy, this will be good. <laughs> <laughs> the pious Christian explanation is, well, he, found some, he, he had some sort of mystical vision that was so mind-blowing and being a humble man, you know, and it was so far beyond anything that he had experienced, he just quit writing about it. You know, oh, bet me. <laughs> 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 well, Scott and I found a text called the Aurora Consurgiens, all right? Yeah. Now, this text is very interesting, George Ann, because it is known 
has been claimed since medieval times that Thomas Aquinas wrote a commentary on the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But the commentary is lost, okay? And it was supposedly his last work. Well, the Aurora Consergiens claims to be that lost commentary. Now, here's an interesting thing. Three of the surviving manuscripts do not ascribe any authorship to this text at all. And once you read the sections of this text that we put in the Transhumanism book, you'll see why. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, you, you hear my co-author laughing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> Sweating. <laughs> well, the, the other reason, George Ann, is that two other manuscript sources of this medieval document attribute it to Thomas Aquinas. All right. mm -hmm. So in other words, approximately half, or, or to be more accurate, 40% of the surviving extant medieval manuscripts of this document ascribe it to Aquinas. Now, when you read this thing, George Ann, what is very, very clear is that the entire Christian imagery of God as as the bridegroom and the church as the bride yeah. has been completely inverted. Oh. God is now the bride and the church, or in this case the writer, meaning Aquinas himself, is the bridegroom. Oh. And if you read this even more carefully, it gets so ecstatic in terms of the way that that it's being written, that you lose all distinction between God and church, or in other words, between God and man altogether. Wow. And so you end up with an androgynous fusion of the two. <laughs> and, you know, obviously this would have been big time heresy. <laughs> oh, no fooling. Added to the fact that God seems to receive his own revelation in the midst of that union. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this becomes extremely, extremely important. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we're sitting there reading all of this, George Ann, and, and, and it becomes clear why the church wanted to suppress this particular document. Because basically what it means is that one of the, you know, if, if we're correct in our reading, what it means is one of the major medieval theologians had a vision of some sort at the end of his life that lay utterly outside of the Christian experience altogether, yeah. but one that hearkened back to, to uh, this, this metaphor that, that Scott was talking about that gives rise to the idea that the fall is a fall from a higher state. Yeah. And one of those higher states, of course, being androgyny in, in the esoteric tradition. So, you know, we find this manuscript by Aquinas, and <laughs> oh, <brother. laughs> it's pretty clear, you know, why this would have been a huge problem, you know, not only to the medieval church, but even today, you know, uh, amongst many, because, after all, this this is the premier uh Western theologian, um, yeah. there's there's no escaping it, and and for well, him to have heard that Joseph and I did not write <laughs> the views that are put forward in in Aquinas. These right. are <laughs> as long yeah, as we are proposing a new idea, we are just simply exposing an old idea. Right, yes. right, exactly. Yeah, most people don't even, yeah, they, uh, thank you. It, it, most people, George Ann, don't even know that this manuscript exists. They're not even aware of it. And this is the reason we included it, because if you look at, and, and the reason really that we, I think we included finally all of the talk about literature that we do, you know, and, and again, you find this, the reason I, I entered the discussion of Aquinas via Dante is that if you look at Dante carefully, what you find is the same sort of agenda that, that Scott was talking about with Dorian Gray. You find the inversion 
of evil being used as a means of transforming the human individual, in this case, Dante himself. How or why? Well, how does he get out of hell? He gets out of hell by going directly to the center and climbing out of it up the back of Satan himself. Oh, boy. That was the key. <laughs> that was the key right there. Yeah. Because that's, that literally is the same sort of alchemical agenda that you have in, in Dorian Gray. Mm. Grinding, grinding, so-called grinding the sins of, of the present into powder. Wow. In other words, the whole agenda is, is, is alchemical. And we could take it one step further back from Aquinas to Plato. Okay. Oh, yeah. Which brought us kind of back to the same idea of an original androgynous type of creation in the speech of Aristophanes recorded by Plato in his symposium, The Banquet, where Aristophanes is giving the definition or the origin of love mm -hmm. and begins with an original human race, which somehow was offensive to uh, Zeus or Jupiter, mm -hmm. and because of the ability of these original humans who were strangely male-male, female-female, and male-female, who propagated in an alchemical way on the ground or within themselves. Mm -hmm. <coughs> their high intelligence and their reach to become more like the God who created them yeah. uh, resulted in what? A separation, a division. Mm -hmm. Not not a distinction, but a, a division between the original people. And the division left them essentially lost and climbing back to reunite themselves and clinging to one another so tightly that they would not eat, and when one would die, the other one would not go on. Wow. So the idea of an angry god um, wanting to separate the, the unity and the love of these original people and to stop them from elevating themselves had to divide them. Well, for us, this was just too familiar with the, the stories that are told within the other religions of a, a first mm -hmm. Adam, so to speak, mm -hmm. who was created in the image of God, and then a division takes place where from out of him comes a, another person, Eve, mm -hmm. and the human race moves forward in further and further divisions rather mm -hmm. than distinctions. Well, when we we continue to see this the same pattern from ancient philosophy, the Maya, the the, the Mayan, the Hindu, the Bhagavad Gita stories. Mm -hmm. We we just continue to see the the Vedas, the the repeated story over and over and over of division, rather than the view of distinctions. Well, Scott, isn't that also reflected? twice, not only in the beginning of uh, the scriptures, but in the also in the Tower of the Tower of the Babel moment. Mm -hmm. Well this is exactly this is exactly how we began the book because we realized how can you talk about the transhumanist agenda to create this higher person and potentially get to the highest level androgynous person again, unless you go back to the beginning and ask, are there stories when that original person, from the standpoint of ancient culture, civilization, their religions, their philosophies, if they have in common that first kind of joined androgynous unified person, and why are they divided? What is the goal? They have to be split divided and separated to keep them essentially in their place and from never getting any higher. Right. Well, you have right. to go back to the fall moment within those same religions. Right. Where does it come from? If there's a common thread of a original human, so to speak, who was more like its original um, undifferentiated 
unified God. And from that, it doesn't come out as a general distinction, but a complete radical division to separate and to lower. Right. What if that same moment is tied throughout world history in the ancient stories? And it is. So we it started is. our book saying you have to be aware the transhumanist goal to get higher is because there was an original fall, and the fall was from a sense of unity to a place of division and weakness. So what is the goal, and what if this goal was achieved? What if we artificially manufactured, created, implanted? What if we became as God and put that original higher being, so to speak, back into human history? What does it mean for human history in the future? Bingo. What does it mean yeah. for us who may not be those who are willing to be artificially transformed through, let's say, genetics or through foods which have been genetically modified or Bingo. through technology which is being implanted right and left around us and we're told and we're sold a bill of goods. This is all for your good. Eat this food, it's better. Take this technology, it's better. Right. Accept this type of surgery, it's better. What if we are artificially, in a sense, climbing up the back of the devil to elevate ourselves artificially to a level that is to be like God, which is, in fact, nothing like that? Bingo. Wow. Yeah. Bingo. Well, you know, you mentioned um, foods. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, in the Bible, as I know both of you know, um, a scene where uh, Joshua, I believe it is, sends the spies out into the land. And they come back and they say, oh, we are grasshoppers, you know. Um, and they're carry it takes two men to carry a cluster of grapes. And I've always thought, my goodness, genetically modified food. <laughs> food, right. <laughs> oh. Well, this, you know, this is the other thing that, that I think people have to understand. When, when Scott referred to, to the image of Dante, you know, climbing up the back of the devil, well, yeah. that's literally what, what we think these technologies are doing. This is why we... we strategize transhumanism as an alchemical agenda but if you look at you know we spent a whole chapter in the book on genetically modified food and when we wrote the book which was what Scott a year and a half year somewhere ago yeah it's always hard to say the books seem to to yeah. reverberate within us for about 20 years before that <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right. Right. I think it was about two years ago <laughs> oh. But anyway, you know, at the time we wrote it, George Ann, none of the current studies that are just now coming out this last summer yeah. about how genetically modified foods are, in fact, introducing genetic modifications into the DNA of, you know, animals, be they insects or humans, yeah. that, that eat it. Yeah. You know, and, and at the time, you know, we, when we were writing the book, we were hypothesizing, well, the goal, the real goal here of modifying the food is to modify the man again. You know, there is your, uh, there is your vegetable man. Oh, boy. And, and if, you know, and, and let's go further. If you can have, as we have seen, George Ann, the idea of using genetic engineering to create chimeras, you know, pigs that, that, that manufacture human blood yeah. or mice with human brain cells. You know, we talk oh. about all of this in the book. Well, if you can do that, you can also introduce or splice the genes of animals and plants. Yeah, well, yes. So quite literally, the technologies are making possible the fulfillment of each of those four stages of reverse engineering back up that ladder of descent animal man, vegetable man, mineral man, and finally androgynous man. So to us, you know, again, the whole, the whole agenda looks nothing other than 
it's it's a modern scientific update of of a very very old esoteric agenda. Uh, that's all it is, as far as we can see. Oh my gosh! Well, if we are what we eat, we better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would oh. agree with that. <laughs> well, you know, they, they they are putting uh, they've got experimental crops of mm. tobacco where they oh, have yeah. put human genes in the tobacco. Mm. Yeah. Uh, in the rice, yeah. and and this this stuff, um, the pollens and things, it it travels everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's already out of the bag. I mean, I don't think it can be put back in the bag. No, and here in in California, where we have a a proposition on the ballot, yeah, thirty seven, which deals specifically with food labeling because of the genetically modified and engineered food. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge amount of advertisement against that, against putting labeling that identifies you are eating something which has been genetically modified. <laughs> and at the end of every commercial, and they are ubiquitous, you cannot get away from this anti-Prop 37 commercial, at the end always says, Major Punning by the Monsanto Corporation. <laughs> you know, DuPont exactly. and Monsanto every time at yeah. the end of it and what is the, the thing they're trying to tell people it will cost you more in grocery money every month yeah. and you cannot afford to spend more on money for uh, useless irrelevant food labels and but you know but it, what it may cost you Georgian is a modification as as Certain French studies are now finding out a modification that shuts, literally shuts your your genes down much earlier in life. In other words, shorter lifespan. Yeah. It can cause liver failures. They're finding out cancers. So it's no wonder that you have nations like Russia, Hungary, China, India, even more recently Germany, and certain limited bands in France. You know, it's no wonder these nations are turning away from this because quite literally this stuff is fulfilling its alchemical goal it is modifying man oh. so you know this this way book, yeah the, this book we wrote uh, if we took all of the research and material that was not included within the book oh for a number of reasons um, yeah. the, the book would have been ten times the size that it was I wish it yeah. was <laughs> oh, there were reasons it could not be, George. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were. There were moments I looked at what we included, and I called Joseph and said, "Did we really put that in there?" Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes, and the Aquinas and the Aquinas chapter was your idea too. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Must have been too much coffee that day. <laughs> I, just, I don't recall that. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> it just kept it, it just kept unfolding, George, and it, it began yeah. with the, the discussion over over the original creation, over the original fall stories, and then suddenly every connection that began to go with it. Well, if we're talking about an alchemical agenda, and we are talking about a fall from higher unified to lower divided, that fell into the the thing that we have continued to press with the topological metaphor, which I think at some point Joseph should say a little bit more about for those who are reading it for the first time and are interested yeah. in the book. But from there, we connect it to literature, to the Middle Ages, to the 19th century, which seemed to be a renaissance of, of, of questioning and trying to seek for answers on who is, who are we, I guess, really was, mm -hmm. was the question because of an explosion of literature which began to question it and then scientific studies that began to question it and at the same time the discussions over things like Dorian Gray, mm -hmm. Frankenstein, Aquinas, oh boy, yeah. these began to just say wow people have been understanding this and working towards it for a very long time and trying to leak information and that yeah. is exactly what Wilde was doing. He was leaking information. Yeah. And he took a pose that he was not, but he was very much the Dorian Gray of his own life that was moving as far as he could 
into areas of experience to find out how far he could go while trying to hide it behind an exterior that seemed to veil it while he was revealing it at the same time that he was writing it. And Percy Shelley... Oh, boy. Who, yeah, we got to talk about him. Yeah. <laughs> Percy Shelley, who, who uh, preceded um, uh, Oscar by a number of years, not too many, um, was doing the same thing with his poetry to, to such a degree that his influence, even in some very uh, challenging poems, uh, Prometheus Unbound, uh, the Witch of Atlas, we began to see the same images of um, hermaphrodites and androgenes and mm -hmm. alchemy and the caves where mysticism and, and spells took place with the original creation of sun and moon and earth and gold, and we just went, wow, they, they have been after this for a while. Is it coincidental or is it just artsy people who are trying to spill some really nice stories, but here comes the, the idea again. Who is Percy Shelley deeply indebted to? Paracelsus. Right. Albertus right. Magnus. Right. Alchemist. The connections back to Aquinas yes. with alchemy. alchemy. And, and then one step further, you have kind of that Masonic interest with Oscar Wilde and the Golden Dawn interest with Oscar Wilde. You go back just a little bit to Percy Shelley, who seems to be doing the same thing with his poetry. Yep. And who else is he deeply indebted to at the time? <laughs> None other than <laughs> okay. the founder of the Illuminati. Yep. Oh, brother. And yeah. oh. <laughs> so, so much so that he's carrying around the very documents, the founding documents of the Illuminati, everywhere that he goes. Everywhere he goes, George is. Oh my He's gosh. carrying them with him as his own not to be parted with library when he travels. Mm. And where where does this Bavarian movement really get its its start? Of course, Ingolstadt. Right. And where strangely does Frankenstein's future become assembled? And Ingolstadt. Oh. Bingo. Yeah. And yeah, the whole novel, George Ann, I mean he's 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 parading his his alchemical agenda by setting Frankenstein in Ingolstadt. It wasn't even subtle. <laughs> it was, yeah, it wasn't even subtle. You know, <laughs> so, you know and, and I should I should point out uh, and let Scott talk about the fact that that uh, because he convinced me in the in the process of writing this book that that Frankenstein is not by Mary Shelley; it is by Percy Shelley. Yeah. That was um, that became almost obvious on the first page of Frankenstein. Oh yeah, and I, I recall the the day that we that Joseph and I sat together and I began raising the question to him by reading him sections of Frankenstein, and he said. We have to include this in the book. Mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, let's let me do some more research before we jump that far, because we know that every English uh, major professor and uh, higher critic in English literature is going to attack this one if we don't have a bunch of research on this." Yeah. And so that set off about a year of doing nothing but analyzing Percy's poetry, his mm -hmm. history, his life, his interests, his reading list. And then it just became too obvious. And so in the midst of adding the section on, on Frankenstein, which uh, tied in the ideas of alchemy, uh, the Illuminati, atheism, mm -hmm. and androgyny, well, it, it just fit too easily into the package of what we were writing, and it resulted in, in its own book, um, perhaps in about six months, that will that will be coming out on uh, Percy Shelley, the true author of Frankenstein. Yeah, Scott has his own book, uh, George Ann, coming out, yeah. exploring exploring this authorship of Frankenstein question further. I was but, going to ask Scott about his book. Well, the reason that this is so significant, you know, is that Shelley, number one, he puts this terribly uncoded reference to the Bavarian Illuminati. Yeah by setting Frankenstein in the very city where that organization began, yeah. Ingolstadt, all right? 
And the other thing that makes this such a profoundly transhumanist work is that if you read Frankenstein, you know, the, the so-called hero, Victor Frankenstein, is, is literally stitching together a new creation, a new man. Yeah. Out of the old, you see. Yes. And, and again, this and is... And added to that, it even appears there are animal parts sewn in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So in other words, this, you know, this is, this is all alchemical again, once again, George Ann. And what's so very peculiar is that Shelley was so steeped in, in the science of his day that you cannot come to any other conclusion other than that he sees where all this is going to go. And, and sees basically the alchemical agenda behind it. And, and this is what he's cluing us into with Frankenstein. So again, you know, you've, you've got this massive kind of transhumanist underground literary agenda all the way from, from Thomas Aquinas's last writing through Dante and bang, it, it pops up with a vengeance in the 19th century. Tell us about Paracelsus and his homunculus. Oh, gee. <laughs> and what technique he used to produce it? Well, again, this goes this goes back to to uh, Frankenstein because in the novel there is a very explicit reference to Paracelsus. Pardon me, to Paracelsus. And Paracelsus, of course, was probably the most famous Renaissance alchemist. Mm -hmm. And he wrote about the homunculus. Now, the homunculus, quite literally, is an artificial life form that is produced, if you read alchemical literature, that's produced by alchemical means. And here's, here's a key point, George Ann. When you read this literature, they will talk about making this homunculus, literally, a, you know, an artificial human, in a flask. Yes in a flask. Yeah. So in other words, we have to, in a certain sense, be looking at a residue or a, a legacy of some technological knowledge that was passed down in alchemical literature literally for centuries, if not millennia. Because we're coming back to that point now with our own technology. Yeah. The, idea, the idea that you could create life in a flask in the 16th century, <laughs> yeah. okay, you know, oh. that's kind of stretching things a bit, but nonetheless, it's there. Well, and, and, without, the, and without the aid of a woman. And, yeah. and this, is, this is the key thing, George Ann, yes, it's just like Scott said. You read this alchemical literature, and what they're trying to do is not only create an artificial life form, a homunculus, but do so without the normal process of human procreation. Yeah. In other words, they're looking, they're looking to create, by technological means, they're looking to create a kind of virgin birth. Yeah, a, a test tube baby. A test tube baby, yeah. exactly, oh, exactly. Boy. Now, the interesting thing that, that we also <laughs> ran into, George, as we, were, as we were researching Paracelsus, <laughs> we, both, we were both so stunned that we just sort of sat there for a few minutes and, and decided, okay, well, we have to put this in the book, too. <laughs> <Yeah. know? laughs> and that was modern... Uh, modern um, pathologists have gone back and dug up Paracelsus out of his grave in, in the church in Switzerland, all right? Oh, my goodness. And they've made an amazing discovery about him or her. <laughs> <laughs> or, well, we don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that is that Paracelsus apparently was very androgynous. Oh, my goodness. In other words, yeah, possessed of... of sexual characteristics <laughs> that were ambiguous okay oh my goodness and you know this this opened up a whole other area of, of exploration <laughs> yeah and another chapter in the book and another chapter in the, in the book <laughs> which somehow but, you know, tied back to oscar wilde percy shelley and 19th yeah. century explosion of studies into gender and who yep. we are yeah well that brings up a very good question who are we? 
Well, maybe this is a good time to go into the metaphor. Um, there's been this theme, George Ann, and it really began way back in the Giza Death Star Destroyed, in, yeah. in that very strange appendix to Chapter 9. Because I've had for a number of years, um, even even before Scott and I met, you know, and, and he and I have been friends for literally about half of our lives, I've had this idea that if you look at certain types of, of philosophical or religious texts, I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Neoplatonists, the Hermeticists, I'm, I'm thinking very definitely of certain things in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it's all over the world. Yeah. There's this metaphor of the creation, all right? Yeah. And the creation literally begins, just like the modern physics theory, with nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. With absolute zilch nada, you know. And if we can if we can imagine an infinitely extended sea of nothing in every direction, then of course, you know, that's kind of being oxymoronic, because if you've got nothing, you've got no directions. But if you can kind of imagine this infinitely extended nothing, and then simply draw a line through it or around it, then what you've really done, the instant you've done that, is you've created three things. You've created one region of nothing, you've created another region of nothing, and you've created the common surface between the two. All right? Now, this is so profound because what you're doing at the same time is you're also creating number. And interestingly enough, when you go back and read the Egyptians or you read certain Neoplatonists, like a fellow by the name of Iamblichus, or even the Pythagoreans, they will tell you that number itself arises from this process of creation. So you, you work through this metaphor long enough, George Ann, and wh what you finally come to is man, all right? Now, interestingly enough, in, in the ancient versions of, of this metaphor, mankind is a little universe. He's a microcosm of the universe itself. And the reason why is that mankind is the interface between two very different regions, the corporeal world and the spiritual or the non-corporeal or whatever you wish to call it, the, right. the intellectual, the mental, you know. Uh, he's the interface. He's that common surface. The universe, on the other hand, when you look at these uh, ancient versions of the metaphor, and you find this particularly in the East, the universe is sometimes described as a large man. This is why you find uh, in, in Vedic tradition, you find the whole process of creation itself described in graphically sexual terms. All right, yeah. but that's not really so strange. You can find similar ideas of of the universe being a large man or mechanthropos. You can find it even in Eastern Orthodoxy. Of all oh boy! <laughs> so, you know, I spent I I cut my eye teeth on Maximus the Confessor. You know, and it's it's all yeah. over the place in that guy. So you know, we, you find this whole metaphor shot through uh, ancient cultures, ancient religions, philosophy, and it becomes it becomes kind of an underground tradition. This is this is the real point I think that people have to latch on to. After the rise of Christianity and the spread of Christianity, it becomes a kind of underground tradition to a certain extent because it is the basis of alchemy. All right. It's it's the cosmological physical basis of alchemy. And the reason why is that if you look again at this originating nothing that sets the whole process in motion, that nothing is really the philosopher's stone. It's, it's the self-transforming medium, physical medium of all creation. That's the philosopher's stone. Oh. Yeah. My goodness. Well, gosh. Um, well, Joseph, what what constitutes a human being in law? 
Oh, gee. <laughs> I mean, if we are, if we are patent, patentable, yeah. Yeah. patentable. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh. Well, this, you, I, I, I think I see what you're getting at, and Scott and I spent some time in the book raising the question. We never really pursued it because we're planning to write yet another book as kind of a follow-on to, to Yahweh, the two-faced God. Um, but the question you're implying is, is most people are familiar with the fact that the slight genetic modifications that companies like Monsanto or DuPont have introduced into their seeds allow them to patent their seeds, all right? Oh. So let's extend the logic. If those seeds in turn can be, if farmers can be sued for merely having the presence on their land of seeds from Monsanto that they did not plant that just get dropped there and bird droppings or whatever, and yeah. and they've done this sort of thing. Yes. All right. Then what happens to genetic modifications either deliberately or inadvertently introduced into human beings as the result of the consumption of these foods. Yeah. Are they then patentable? Are they then intellectual property? And a further problem that arises, George Ann, is let's look at the case of these mice that have been given the ability to grow human brain cells, human neurons. Yes. At what point, then, you see, what transhumanism is really asking is, at what point, how do we define human? Yeah. What does it mean to be human in law? Well, our point in raising all of these things, and what transhumanism is forcing us to look at, is that the definition of human nature cannot be, and this, is, this has been the problem throughout the centuries, cannot be a frozen, once-for-all thing in time. Oh, my goodness. You see, this is the whole problem raised by those ancient texts that, that talk about a mingling of humanity and somebody else. Oh. You see, we're, we're being forced by the technology, in other words, to re-examine the jurisprudence and what we mean by the concept human nature. Yes. And let me, give you an ex let me give you an example that Scott and I ran into. Actually, Scott ran into this. And he told me about this book, and I had to go out and get it, too. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and the book is the book is a really, really, I don't know how else to describe it other than just plain wild. It's, and I forget, Scott, do you remember her name, the, the lady's name that wrote this book? You know the uh, one I'm I, talking about. Yes, I, I knew exactly the moment you started laughing, um, which, which book you're describing. It was, uh, I think... University of Harvard Press. Yeah, but, yeah. But no, I don't recall the uh, the person who wrote it. Oh, uh, let me see. It's, the book is called Hermaphrodites, Georgian. <laughs> and yeah, it is by Harvard University Press. It's called Hermaphrodites and the Medieval Invention of Sex. All right. Oh my goodness. And it's published by Harvard University Press, and it's by Alice Domerat Drager. All right, it's a, it's a really interesting book, but it's just, it's also kind of creepy. Oh, boy. And the reason why is that during the 19th century, we keep going back to the 19th century, you have this explosion of, uh, I don't know, transhumanist literature with, you know, Shelley and Wilde and, and uh, people like that. But at the same time, you had appearing all over Europe mystified gynecologists. Okay. Oh, brother. <laughs> Scott's laughing and I'm laughing. I know where and, you're going. <laughs> well, the reason, the reason the gynecologists were mystified is that they were running into people that it was next to impossible to classify as, as one or the other sex, okay? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, you know, you read this book, you read this book, and, and you know, obviously they certain sexual tendencies tended to predominate in these people. And, and, and I have to qualify, you know, if you run out and buy this book, 
be aware that it's not a book you want to leave laying around on the table for your kids to pick up, okay? <laughs> because there's pictures of, of these people, you know, and, and their strange equipment. And it, it boils down to this. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this whole explosion of, and, and that's what the gynecologists at the time were calling it, of hermaphroditism, all right? The reason I'm pointing this out is because this raised problems for these people in law. Oh my goodness. You see, because what, what did, what did 19th century European law, how did it deal with humans? Well, it dealt with them just as we tend to do to this very day, as male or female. Yes. So you had cases of males in France, you know, they finally made a determination, well, these people are male, being raised as females, oh. and even getting married. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So you see, this posed just endless problems in law. Well, what so, would cause such a explosion of... Well, the, you know, oh boy, Scott, you want to handle that one? <laughs> want me to take it because we did discuss that George Ann but we didn't put any of our our um, we chose not to put these discussions in in the book so let me demur to my co-author if he wants to go there, <laughs> we'll, okay. go there. well I guess to put it simply and without expanding the, the problem too large is mm. perhaps there was no explosion whatsoever it's just that the the question and the investigation began to be more um, available to, to discuss right. Right. that this is not a, a new problem or a new explosion. This is just simply an explosion of information that right. had previously been suppressed for obvious reasons of, of privacy, uh, obvious reasons also of, of law, as Joseph pointed out. When men tended to have far more rights than women, Right. It, yeah. it may have been expedient for parents to just simply make a very fast decision, and when you only have two boxes to check on a form or two choices right. to write down, it was pretty obvious that people were not physicians or parents were not going to uh, identify uh, lack of determination or intersexed or you right. know, question mark or I don't know, he's not mine or she's not mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have to make a decision. And right. so given the fact that more rights were available to, to men, um, it may have been a little bit easier to make some expedient choices. And that really just became a, a, a point which for us was why in the 19th century, why was there this explosion of information and literature which all tended to be asking some of the same questions about right. who is man, where do we come from? What do the religions and the ancient philosophies and cultures have to say? And how were these, this being perhaps even more important today, how were these unclassified, say, intersex individuals dealt with in ancient cultures? Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is that they were dealt with, perhaps with far more respect in some mm -hmm. cases than today. In some now, in, cases, weren't they actually worshipped? They they were the, the mediums between the people and and the god that, that made them and yeah you know George yeah George Ann I you know I, I grew up in South Dakota uh, yeah. around around the Lakota nation yes and in their tradition these these types of people are revered and and the and the whole reason they're revered is they view them as standing closer to God than than your normal normally sexed people well again that's because they're working with that metaphor you know you've got yeah. the fall from androgyny through mineral through vegetable and finally to animal man so that's you know they're working from that cosmology but yeah I, ha I have to agree with my co-author George Ann that's that's the best explanation for why this is happening in the 19th century and that's kind of the explanation that that Drager pursues in her book well, um, would, would this, would these um, types of people, are they, would you say, are they still being born? And if well, sure. so, is it 
probably more prolific than in past times? I wouldn't know about how prolific it is, George Ann, but you can't you can't come away from reading Drager's book with any other impression that this is something that's been going on for like like Scott said, for, for a while and that that really is just the information began to get talked about more openly for whatever yeah. reason in the nineteenth century. Well but um, this also reminds me, Joseph, that mm -hmm when we began to look at this question and to do the research behind it and the history of it and it's, it's being recorded aside from the, the religious and cultural issues that were much older mm -hmm. um, this led us to some disturbing studies that were being conducted oh yeah um, regarding character traits oh yeah I'll let you handle this one I've got to take a quick break <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back okay uh, Go ahead, and, Scott. Well, it figures that he would leave me on that one. Oh boy. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things that uh, we we began to see uh, see if I can even find the, the section where we begin to discuss this um, was that um, studies regarding genetics began to uh, appear in our, our research with given someone's personality traits, which traits are being investigated with um, present genetic studies. And what bothered us, I think, the, the most was that there were some very odd things such as the ability to curl the tongue or things that seemed rather absurd. Yeah. But one of the other studies that was going along with this pertain directly to what is the nature or character traits involved with homosexuals. When we began to see that tied to the same issues of character traits with certain um, genetic patterns and where these studies were taking place, it raised the question, what is it about the various gender studies and character traits that is so important and mm -hmm. that that created in us a, a certain tension that we really didn't want to open up too much in, right. in the book because you know one can theorize as to the question of why tongue rolling or tongue curling is related to um, the issues of let's say homosexual genetics or brain structure mm -hmm. in homosexuals well, Why even ask some of the questions related to traits and brains and genetics? And why um, have the military doing it? Well, yeah. that's what I had left out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Was well, who was doing the studies. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I came back and I didn't realize you'd left. Yeah, George Ann, we discovered this being done by a major military research facility. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, it raises the question again, why why is this agenda so all pervasive? Yeah. And what possible, you know, we had suspicions that that we discussed and and, and maintained privately that we didn't put in the book as to what we think may be going on with all of this, but uh because the implications of speculating were were so so, you know, dangerous perhaps yeah. or that number one we did not want to to appear that we're trying to uh, oppose or advocate anything in the book right. we're just simply trying to set forward some very interesting and curious stories from ancient history from ancient religions tie those to ancient or medieval literature tie that to modern and 19th century literature, mm -hmm. and then ask, where is this all connected? Where are these things holding some sense of unity together, and how does this relate to what we've done before with um, the, uh, the the studies that are being done in genetics? Uh, I found the, the section in the book regarding some of the, the patterns. Here are some of the, the issues being discussed. Hand skill relative and clasping patterns, arm folding preference, ears ability to move, 
tongue curling, folding, and rolling, musical perfect pitch, novelty seeking personality trait, stuttering, tobacco addiction, <laughs> that's funny, <laughs> uh, alcoholism, and then added lastly, homosexuality. Wow. Well, this from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, oh Human Genome goodness. Project. Yeah. What in the world yeah. would hence feel relative patterns, tongue curling, stuttering, and homosexuality have, <laughs> and yeah. have, have in common? This, this to us was, was mind-boggling, particularly given where the studies came from and given what we were starting to see tied together, which was this original type of story of an undifferentiated, mm -hmm. then differentiated and androgynous, to, to kind of put a single word to it, um, God-human division. And where would these studies lead? That, that has always been our question. We yeah. don't have the answer because to propose one is perhaps to be very wrong or to really set forward something which we'd rather not even discuss. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, Georgia, we, we, we put a lot in this book, but there's a lot, like Scott said, that, that we did not put in the book. That, well, George you know, Ampler, I, I recall in, when we were, when we had laid out of this book, he and I at one point, did, like Aquinas, set the pen or the computers down and paced back and forth a, mm. a hole in his carpet yeah. Saying, and I said, we can't write this. And he mm -hmm. said, you're right, we can't. And we paced back and forth trying to come up with a way to write this book because the amount of research and some of the, the material that, that we were coming across tied to what we had already known with philosophy, theology, literature, and science. Yeah. We, we paced back and forth mm -hmm. literally till, till we had run a, a path in the carpet Mm. past each other, not even speaking other than to say, we can't do this, we can't do this. Oh. And, and there's there's a lot we didn't put into it, Georgian, because it is so, um, well, we think it's very dangerous. Yes. Uh, and, and it is so highly speculative, but nonetheless we do think that there are things that this whole movement is trending to. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to by putting those sorts of things in the book, you know, they would end up being, a, in a certain sense, a distraction from having people weigh and evaluate all of these things for themselves. You're right. But it's like Scott said, we, we literally paced back and forth, and, and there were certain things that, that during the process of discussing this book, uh, we, we just finally said, we can't write this. You know, we we can't put it in the book. Well, what we put in there is controversy. <laughs> well, I know from what I've read, this book could be ten times the size that it is. Oh, easily. Yeah. Easily. Well, I I owe it to Joseph to to have saved the book to having been written because at the point I just put my hands down and said it can't be done. We cannot write this. Um, Joseph had some epiphany, spark of inspiration and ran back to his chair and his desk and began outlining a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And the moment he had it down, which was really the, the division from the al alchemical division, mm -hmm. the moment he did it, he said, this is how we can do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I see that. And and then it, it began to, to take its form. But right. even... Oh, we lost... The guys, oh my gosh, recording right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, that, that was strange. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know why that uh, just simply cut off right in the middle of that, that information. It's the guys at Fort Meade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Then watch out for the drone. <laughs> yeah, watch out for the drone. <laughs> Well, that's great. Uh, well, hmm. tell us about the similarities between Francis Bacon's Solomon's House and hmm. Rockefeller. Oh, boy. Uh, you're referring in there to um, 
Francis Bacon's little book that we talk about called The New Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And that's part of a much larger book that, that Bacon wrote, George Ann, called The Advancement of Learning. Yeah. And The New Atlantis, it's a strange little book. You, if you didn't know it was by Francis Bacon, you would think that it's uh, by some sort of, you know, 16th, 17th century novelist writing a bit of, of science fiction for the day. Yeah. Because in it, what he points out is that there was a very high civilization. It had the ability to circumnavigate the globe, and this, this incidentally, is, is predating the classic civilizations of Egypt and Sumer and so on. So in other words, Bacon, in his own way, is talking about Atlantis, all right? Yeah. And he accounts for the high science of Atlantis by a, a group that he calls Solomon's House, all right? Mm -hmm. And if you if you read what he says, we, we cite the work in detail in, in the transhumanism book. If you read what he says about it, what he's talking about with this Solomon's house is a think tank. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is this think tank is kind of a private uh, a private idea. It's not a government project. In other words, it's it's very private. And it's also clear from Bacon's work that he means North America to be the experiment for this vast agenda, which can only be qualified, if you read his, his work carefully, can only be qualified, once again, as transhumanist. Yeah. Because they're trying to reverse engineer the whole process of the fall, of the fall, and they mean to do so in North America. Well, the connection to Rockefeller, in a nutshell, is if you look at the Rockefeller Foundation and the sorts of things that it funds and the types of experiments it's involved with. I mean, you cannot think of modern agribusiness, you know, Dupont or Monsanto or any of these companies. You cannot think of them without the whole agribusiness concept itself having been promoted by the Rockefeller Foundation back in the 1950s. Yeah. So in other words, North America is, is the grand experiment in this whole transhumanist, uh, alchemical, esoteric agenda. That, that's the bottom line. And it's really interesting that, that you know, the, the royal chancellor, Francis Bacon, would be the one, you know, writing about all of this a full century and a half before the the war for American independence. Mm. So, you know, that 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 right there should give people pause. Oh, yeah. I guess so. Boy. Um Scott? Yes. Can you tell us about um the GMOs be they Monsanto or whatever, in the Syrian seed bank. <laughs> I think Joseph would be better to handle the question, considering this is, is a particular interest with his research, as well as that section in, in the book, which was uh, really his, his primary area, which he uh, put in there, that, that particular section on frankenfoods. Okay. Uh, was, was really his own research on that. Yeah, it, well, George Ann, basically it's this. Um, if you go to Iraq, Iraq was, it had a large seed bank, all right, of agronomically engineered seeds. Now, agronomy is what had been done for centuries in agriculture. It's the slow selection, you know. Think of think of Gregor Mendel and his peas. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's the slow selection by careful uh, generational selection of certain traits in plants that you want to promote. Yeah. So, in other words, all of our our, our pre-GMO foods, our grains, wheat, and so on and so forth, had been carefully agro agronomically developed through centuries to be the modern grains that we have now. 
And Iraq had a very large seed bank of these grains that farmers would plant, all right? And, the, and here's the important point about these kinds of seeds. They're not patentable. They arise solely in nature and through the processes of nature by humans selecting certain traits that they want to breed into plants. But this can only occur over generations. But now these seeds don't have animal parts in them? No, they don't have animal parts. They They're don't not... have, they don't, right, they don't have pesticides. They don't have any of this crud yeah. that you find in, in GMO foods. Yeah, These are trash. not GMO foods, all right? Okay. This is, this is the important point that people have to understand. These are not GMO seeds. These are natural seeds done the old-fashioned agronomical way of generational trait selection, all right? Okay. And they're when, not genetically. They're not genetically engineered. When was this um, seed bank in Iraq? Well, it was in Iraq prior to the, our most recent invasion. That's the point. Uh -huh. When we invaded, yeah, ho ho ho. When we invaded, we immediately told the Iraqis they can't plant this seed anymore. <laughs> so, in other words. These companies are, are themselves transforming agriculture and therefore transforming food and therefore transforming man. You know, you cited earlier the, the quotation of Ludwig Feuerbach, man is what he eats. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're eating a bunch of BS that's, that's being put out by agribusiness companies, you know, that's what you're going to become. Yeah. Uh, and these ties also to the, the other point that had been raised, which is at what point does something become um, property or trademark? Exactly. exactly. When, and when they have already begun to trademark particular genes, and then we're beginning to use them. Exactly. Humans, and oh. then we take that to the other step of the food and the lawsuits that have gone on with, well, our seed has been found in this, therefore we own the right to this and can right. sue for ownership. That does raise the question as to the legality of what is going on, as to who will own who in the future. Is it purely hypothetical, or is, this, is there any precedent in law to say, well, this is a really important question that should be raised, because if we are moving towards a new human or a modified human, and that modification comes from outside and is then put within that person, does that person continue to own 100% of themselves, or does somebody have a right later to claim it? And uh, we, we did not even touch the issue of things like vaccines and what takes right. place with the future of, of vaccinations or how those have been modified or <laughs> even the purpose of those, though I know Joseph recently blogged about that, and I have to say it, 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 it left me speechless. Well, let me jump in here, too, my friend, and, and add, George Ann, that something else that, that Scott and I talked about when we were talking about this precise issue that he's, he's referring to, namely ownership yeah. and what happens, you know, when you have a genetically modified human resulting from the consumption of GMO food, which is now appearing more and more likely it will happen if it hasn't already. To us, one of the things that, that we mentioned we didn't talk about in the book because, again, we didn't want to introduce distractive issues, but I think we can safely mention it here, is this may be one of the rationalizations or explanations why they are wanting now to track people's DNA yeah. so much. Because, you know, they may already be aware that this stuff has a capacity for the genetic modification of, of the human genome. Oh. And this may be a way of tracking it, you see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this, this transhumanist agenda never quits. And, and, and the real bottom line, Georgian, is, is that it's here, it's going to stay. The fact is it's technologically driven. Yes. And it's also and therefore, financially driven. And it's financially driven. And, yeah. and the eugenic uh, movement. Oh it, yes. There's no question that it is mm. that is driven by profit, population control, and yeah. ownership. 
Well, so it, it, these are some very important issues for the, the future of the human race. Well, yeah. th this business of, um, oh, there's too many people, that goes way back. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. How far back does it go, Joseph? Well, it goes, it goes back to Mesopotamia. Oh, uh, it goes, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it goes back to Babylon, Sumer. You know, the stories of the genetic modification of man, you know, well, the next thing you know, mankind is out reproducing the gods and therefore constitutes a threat. So oh. the gods decide, well, we have to get rid of a lot of them. Yeah. You know, that, there's no other reason given other than a, bra, a raw, brute, uh, brutal geopolitical reason in those texts. Yeah. And, you know, in a certain sense, they make much more sense that way than modern religious rationalizations. Oh, boy, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I was going to ask you, when um, could we consider the person known as Yahweh as a racist for, <laughs> for selecting just, a, you know, a little bit of people? Well... I hear Scott laughing. Well, it's a question we've talked about. Um, Maybe the, the easiest way to answer that one, Joseph, is, is to refer back to the, the topological metaphor and just simply say whatever, whatever introduced this religion of driven by a Yahwehist monotheism as opposed mm -hmm. to, say, a, a Buddhist type of or oriented form of monotheism. Mm -hmm. you know, that can even be fairly said because Buddhism is more of a philosophy than than a, a theology. But mm -hmm. if if we take the the Yahwehist monotheism and apply it back into what we say is a more ancient teaching um, and way of looking at things, with what is spelled out extensively with the, the topological metaphor, what we have is a very serious difference between things which move towards unity and distinctions within that unity, which should be something most Christians latch onto and say, the Trinity, I understand, right? Right, right. Three and one, one and three, uh, this, you know, to, to oversimplify it, but the idea of unity and oneness what, with a sense of, of distinctions, if, if that concept were taken but looked at a little bit more seriously, what we find introduced in more of the Yahwehist type of, of religions is really a division, and this goes back to the idea of the fall, yeah. of slicing, yeah. dividing, and separating yeah. the elect and the non-elect, the chosen yeah. and the, right. the damned, those who right. were ordained to damnation from the beginning of the world, whatever all the arguments brought into that may be yeah. by theologians. But that point for us is, is actually a very important one, it, not in a way to attack any particular religion, but to look at the fundamental premise behind it, which is, are we moving towards dividing humanity to a point that we must end it in an apocalyptic um, us versus them moment, wow. or are we wanting to go behind that and say, this concept or person or fabricated idea of dividing humanity, be it under the, the name of Yahweh or anybody else, when that, that concept is introduced into human history, it always results in division, yeah. violence, yeah. judgment, yes. and ultimately the desire, the need to create an alchemical moment of crushing humanity into powder to create the ultimate new, better society. Right. That, for us, was the, the key motive behind what we did in Yahweh, the two-faced God, as well as in transhumanism. And perhaps we tried to be a little bit more subtle, I think, in transhumanism. Mm -hmm. But the point still remains, why is it that these, these warring factions, which claim the same originating uh, divine being, yeah. turn 
against one another to the point of it must end with an apocalyptic moment brought on by some type of alchemical burning, destruction, and then resurrection or creation of a new person. Hmm. Where does that concept begin and why is it unique within, so to speak, the Yahweh's traditions? So rather than kind of focus on who is that, you know, God, so to speak, ours is really, I think, more important to go behind that question and ask what is the basic premise behind it? How does it remove itself from a more ancient position right, of right. unity Bingo. with distinction, which we would affirm within that, that triadic structure, which Joseph mm -hmm. talked about earlier with the metaphor. We fully believe that. We fully hold that. We think it makes perfect sense and it has an ancient tradition. When it is disrupted, then it results in something which is antithetical to the future of humanity, which disturbs us greatly. Let me give you an example, Georgian, okay. um, of uh, my friend is making a very, very important point uh, of this idea of unity in distinctions. All right, mm -hmm. and you find you find this philosophical point made a lot within Christian apologetics. But to us, if I may speculate a bit and maybe perhaps put a few words in my friend's mouth, but at least for me, for me having looked at this metaphor for so long in my life, it yes. appears increasingly to be the case that the this metaphor is the ultimate origin for those elements within Christianity, like the doctrine of the Trinity, or even more importantly, the Incarnation. And why is that important? Well, let's go back to what the metaphor says. You've got two regions with a common surface. Well, if you look at the dogmatic formulation of the doctrine of Christ within Christian history, I'm not talking about the modern American uh, war evangelical civil religion. Right. Right? I'm, talking, I'm talking about Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism or Anglicanism. You know, one, of the, one of these churches that adheres to a certain extent to the historical definitions. Right. Well, if you look at that definition, what does it say? It says that one person exists in two completely different but two complete natures, divine and human. Well, there's your common surface again. Yeah. So in other words, the way, the way that doctrine is formulated also appears to me increasingly to come out of this metaphor, and therefore it's not coming out of anything unique to the religion. It's coming out of something much deeper that antedates that whole Yahweh's tradition. And I think, I think this is what Scott's getting at. This is what I've been getting at. Um, and, and when you go back to that, then it's, it's at that point that you see Yahwism for the revolution against that metaphor that ultimately it was. Wow. My goodness. And, and I hope I'm not putting words in, <laughs> in my friend's mouth. But, no, that, uh, that is... Uh, I couldn't have put it better, and that's that is a discussion that goes back decades with us also. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think I think pretty much from the very first conversation in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't tell me about Syria and this. Well, seed the seed bank, Georgia, and I, I, it was Iraq, not Syria that the seed bank you're talking about in the book. Mm -hmm. It's Iraq, not Syria. Because you, so we we, you mentioned Syria. No, we didn't mention Syria. We mentioned Iraq, and, and I already answered that question earlier. Okay. Okay. I think, I think you got a little confused. Could with, be. With, with Iraq and, and Syria, but no, it was Syria. Well... What about? Or, pardon me, it was Iraq. <laughs> no, I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. oh boy. <laughs> well, we know that religion was invented to control man, and it's all about an agenda. And you know, we ourselves. 
could could we say that we are an engineered species? Well, I mean, speaking for myself, Georgia Ann, you know, from having written so many books about ancient times, ancient civilizations, mm -hmm. and, and the possibility that there was a high science in ancient times, uh, I think you can't come away from looking at some of those Mesopotamian texts with any other opinion if you view those texts as containing scientific metaphors. In my word, you can you can read some of them, like like the Karsag tablets, you know, which is kind of a little known miscellany in in uh, Mesopotamian text. You can't come away from looking at some of those things without coming to the conclusion you're looking at descriptions, ancient descriptions of a technology at work. So, from my point of view, um, I think it's it's possible, and you certainly have similar types of texts in, in Vedic literature. Well, Joseph, wouldn't the word created indicate that we're engineered? Well, yeah, there's there's a sense of create, you know, ex nihilo, but there's also the sense of the word create, which means to fashion or to make, you know, mm -hmm. so or to confect. And and I... I, I, you know, for my part, George Ann, I think it's rather clear that this is what the ancient texts are telling us. And when you I, put, go ahead. I was going to say it, it. It becomes even more um, startling when you look back at some of the symbolisms that are used uh, in some of the ancient religions. Yes. DNA and the idea of an uprooted tree. Yes. And that all things are are connected back into this, there is a, a section really in the this front of the book where um, mm -hmm. there is a, a commentary given on the Bhagavad Gita which um, suggests very clearly that human DNA is itself the tree of life, the tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there there is through that tree not only eternity and immortality running through the, the body and the mind, but also a certain sense of cosmic consciousness to the individual person related to the DNA. And oh, this yes. Is, this is exactly where a lot of the, the study is going on right now, of course, with with genetics. Absolutely. I have to agree with that wholeheartedly, Georgia. And, um, in fact, we put a chapter in, in the book, or a section in a chapter in the book, about DNA and, and shamanism, uh, that it's, it appears in some cases, like what shamans are actually accessing is kind of a cosmic or genetic memory in human DNA. Wow. Yeah, and, and you and I have talked about that too, George, yeah. on some shows, you know, with, with my idea that that the human, the individual human genome doesn't define that person, but rather transduces that individual from the physical medium. So in other words, you know, I, I'm of the view of, of the uh, British biologist, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who, who thinks that the mind is really a non-local phenomenon. Yes. And that the brain is just sort of the, the radio tuner for it. The transducer? The transducer of it, right. Yeah. Wow. And there's an increasing body of scientific evidence there's very strange sorts of evidence that, that does indeed suggest that even our memories are non-local. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, you know... That's you, the strangest of them all. You have a radio, mm -hmm. and you turn it on, and it captures information, music, right. stories. Right. Um, they're not living in the radio. Of course not, no. But you can turn it off. You can tu turn it off, you can turn Change it on, you can the, tune it here, tune yeah. it there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, I think I think that there is a, a non-local aspect to memory, to mind. In other words, it doesn't live inside the body. You mean, are uh, you was, talking about like the Akashic Records? 
Yeah, you know, like the Akashic Records, uh, something of that sort. In other words, we're, we're dealing once again with very old doctrines. Yes. Uh, you know, that, that have been dressed up in modern garb and so on and so forth. Rupert Sheldrake likes to call it, you know, the morphogenetic field, but, you know, what he's talking about are Akashic Records. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that raises considerably, George Ann, the stakes involved in the question, are we engineered? Yeah. You see, well, if so, what are we engineered for? Exactly. And, you know, if, if consciousness, if, if mind, if memory, if, if personhood and all of that are non-local phenomena, Mm -hmm. then it raises the possibility that, well, we're, we are engineered precisely to transduce those things into this reality. <laughs> so we're right back, you know, we're right back to that metaphor of two regions with a common surface again. In this case, the con you know, I said it earlier, man is the microcosm, the way they view the way they view mankind in this ancient metaphor is as the common surface between two very different realms which brings you right back to Aquinas and yes. what he was talking about, which seems on the one hand a rather blasphemous, but one can understand um, through his description in commentary on Song of Solomon why it is not so much blasphemous as it is just alarming yeah. of a, a common surface of understanding and growth in, in consciousness. Yep, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. What he's doing in that vision is he's 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 living out all of the implications of it, and I think you know you put it you put it to me best, Scott, when you said well you know he uh, maybe it was someone else I don't remember now but I think it was you that that said well the reason that he put it you know he put his pen down as he realized if he kept talking about this he'd end up like Giordano Bruno <laughs> which, oh. which is another part of the story church in yeah <laughs> but it's not a one <laughs> one also raised by Oscar Wilde in picture of yeah. Dorian Gray yeah, exactly. The, again and again, George Ann, this is what the, what we keep running into with these 19th century authors like Percy Shelley and Oscar Wilde is their detailed knowledge and reference to people in that same transhumanist esoteric tradition that have preceded them. It, it, it is, it's nonsensical to, to think of these men as just uh, novelists or you know, right. uh, aesthetic, uh, artsy type of people. These are men whose interest in ancient studies right. and whose dabbling with it yes. is shocking. Oh, yeah, why yeah. were they dabbling with it? Because they understood the implications of it, and how could they explain it and and not be persecuted and led into into either uh, the gallows or um, you know find themselves ostracized completely from society, which is precisely what happened both with Wilde right. and and Shelley. Is neither one was fit for uh, for human society, and they both knew it. And they both thought they could get away with hiding the secrets within their writings. And both admitted that's what they were doing in their more yes. private uh, essays that very few people read. They knew what they were doing. They knew they were trying to encode it and, and hide it and slip oh. it under certain types of novels, stories, poems. And Percy went so far as to, as to say it is really the poets who are the revolutionaries yeah. of, of society. Yeah. And Oscar knew this very well, as, and they both, in a sense, made the mistake of, of taking their, their writings. I, I'm thankful that they, they did this, but they believed that they could hide it, disguise themselves beneath it, and not be seen. Oh. But in, in both cases, these men were not just you know, creative writers or right. you know, uh, RD aesthetics. Aesthetics who were yeah uh, they, they're not just you know they're not just writing these things randomly Georgia right. they're not dropping in names like Paracelsus or Giordano Bruno 
as if they have no idea what. Yeah, as if they have no idea, you know, who they are, or they read about them, you know, in an Encyclopedia Britannica article and thought, oh, gee, that's cool, I'll drop them in, you know. No, (laughs) these 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 men know these people and what they are about intimately. Right, and they are duplicating it in their writings and I would say in their life. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this transhumanist agenda, George Ann, you know, that's, that's the reason really we even talk for a very brief period, not, though not nearly enough as we should have, about Dante in the book and why we talk about Aquinas in the book, because they're all talking about this metaphor. And when it comes right down to it, each of them, especially in Aquinas's case, where you see this profound break mm-hmm. with everything he had written previously, it's as if when he realized the full implications of, of the metaphor that he had been writing about even theologically, he just he just simply quit <laughs> because oh. he couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't he couldn't rationalize the the uh, presence of that metaphor in in that system anymore. It's, it's it constituted a break for him. Uh, and you see the same sort of symbolism in Dante, and and you know, just speaking for myself and my own personal life, in me, you know, because uh, this was ultimately what it led me to come to the conclusion. So you know, it's over and over and over when you see when you see these very bold alchemical references in people like Shelley or Wilde, yeah. it, it, you know, it just, it, 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 it becomes impossible to ignore. And, and really the key, the key for us with Wilde is, you know, we were, we were discussing Wilde one day and I forget what you said, but, uh, Scott, but, but it was something to the effect that when you're reading this book and particularly chapter 11, you're reading a textbook of alchemy. That's what it, that's what it really is. Uh-huh. It's an alchemical novel. Wow. And therefore a transhumanist one. Yeah. And we've not even discussed the issues of the introduction of sacrifice. No, exactly. Transubstantiation, no, exactly. all of the, the issues. <laughs> that sacrifice are, are, is where I was going to go next. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have added that. <laughs> well, I'll let I'll let Scott take the sacrifice one because, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> well, everything is so tied together, isn't it? This this is why yeah, the book could have been you know so much larger mm-hmm. it's because it goes back to the topological metaphor and the principle behind it, which is there must be a cutting, a dividing, a violent separation, mm-hmm. and a death before there can be given a sense of relationship back to that violent, divisive one to begin with. Oh, my god! Which gosh. to us is, is, is exactly what pushes forward the apocalyptic mentality. Yes. Is that if it is believed that the only way to have oneness and unity is by a violent separation and a division, a judgment that slices and sends one into death and says the other one can now participate in life with the one who inspired that sense of violent division, then what are all these rituals that we practice, but in some sense, a more flagrant form of a very dark form of alchemy, which is to, to use death to create life, but a very divisive and violent separation between the elect, the non-elect. That mentality has everything to do with when sacrifice was brought into the most ancient religions and then duplicated over and over, first in a bloody way on the altars and now, so to speak, in an unbloody sacrifice. You mean like eating the body and drinking the blood? Um, This is exactly what what has to be argued uh, in medieval theology, which mm-hmm. is how are we having a sacrifice which is unbloody while it is a sacrifice, and what are we doing but through the process of re-sacrificing the uh, anamnesis, the, the kind of reactment, which is a true reenactment, not just a memory, one has mm-hmm. to, to specify, it's not just a memorial, this is a true participation in that violent event of death. 
oh. which is repeated over and over that you participate in because there's no way to participate in that which you've been cut off from unless you participate in that same violent division and become like it. Yeah. And so what is the ultimate sociological impact? It's going to be a dividing of society and cultures and people because that is the only true way to get back to to eternal life is to become like the one who inspires that mentality. And if there's a a, a paradigm that is older than that, which is completely in contrast to it, why have we left that? Mm. Let's go let's go further, Georgian. That's a um, good question that Scott asked. It's it's a profound one. Oh yes. And Part of the end, this is why, you know, we spend so much time with this topological metaphor idea. Mm -hmm. because, and we spent a lot of time in the beginning of transhumanism looking at the Vedic versions of it, all right? Okay. And when you look at those versions, it's very clear that the idea of sacrifice emerges from the metaphor very early on. Yeah. And then it gets... I don't know, uh, precisely as, as Scott described it, it gets transformed from a metaphor of the, crea of the second creation of distinction and more and more information into a metaphor of the bloody division of something. Yes. And it gets transformed, therefore, from a metaphor of life into that of sacrifice and death. And then you find out of that that what I would view as a profound misinterpretation, you, you see the rise of, of bloody sacrifices about this time when you, when you find this metaphor becoming understood in that fashion. Yeah. You, it's right about that period of time that you see the rise of bloody sacrifice in India. And then from there, of course, uh, the, the, that very ancient civilization spreads eastward, or pardon me, westward. And you find the idea of sacrifice again in, in, in the religions coming out of Mesopotamia, particularly those associated with, with the Yahweh character. Yeah. And, and incidentally, there's a much deeper connection there that I don't even want to go into. <laughs> That's another book, folks. But <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think Scott's exactly right. It's, it's this whole... Um, it's this whole transformation of the metaphor into division, bloody division, taking the knife violent. to the process. Yeah, yeah, violent, taking the knife to the whole process. Um, oh. Yeah, it, it's it's you know the logic, the logic as you say, George Ann, It's it's high time that we start questioning where does this whole idea come from? Right. After all, my word. When someone oh. comes to us and asks us for forgiveness, what do we do? Do we run out and buy a turtle dove and slaughter it? Heavens, no. <laughs> no, of course not. What we do is say, okay, yeah, fine, you're forgiven. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. There goes my turtle dove business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, exactly. Take that off there and use a death. Star.com store. <laughs> no longer selling turtle toes. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. Oh. But you know, you know, when when you view the logic of sacrifice in that fashion, in in a personal sense, does it make sense? You know. Yeah. And and it's at that point that that you begin to raise the profound questions, and, and the question leads ultimately back to this metaphor and how we're understanding it. Mm. My goodness. Well, you know, it's the whole thing. Uh, your name, is your name written in the book of mm -hmm. uh, the living? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of division, a lot of Oh, my gosh. Well, let's look at that image right there, George Ann. Okay. The Book of Life as an image is not really that unique 
to to Christianity. Right. Because in you you know the Akashic records themselves are sometimes referred to by people in in esoteric tradition as the Book of Life. Right. right. The difference being that the understanding within the esoteric tradition of the Book of Life is that everybody's name is written into it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is, again, if you look at the metaphor, it's an information-creating metaphor, and ultimately it creates the specific information content of you and I, all right? Yeah. And that's why you're written in the Book of Life. Well, in the Christian understanding, that that image is turned into not an inclusive image, but an exclusive one. Right. In other words, it's, you know, these people and not those people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And yeah. for this reason and that reason and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. in other words, it becomes the image, the intention of the image is inverted again. Yeah. You know, um, it was it was the great medieval, or pardon me, the the great mythologist uh, Joseph Campbell that in his in his works on mythology pointed out that you have all of these common images, but then then the Yahwist religions come along and invert many of those images into their exact opposite of what they were originally. Yeah, which goes back to the idea of the the serpent as well. And oh, exactly. The DNA symbolism and the tree symbolism. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Because you know, in many of the in many of the of, of the religions that predate Yahwism, you have the symbol of the serpent as the giver of wisdom mm -hmm. and as a symbol of life. Yes. And it's you know, and you can the Yahwist religions, the Yahwist traditions invert that, and they they. You know, you find this you find this explanation in the church fathers quite often. Well, the reason it's inverted, they'll tell you, is that it was really inverted to begin with in all those other ancient religions. And you know, the devils very cleverly disguised all this, and so now the true God came down and explained the real meaning of it all. Okay. Except for the curious uh, issue of Moses raising the pole with the serpent. Yeah, exactly. the Caduceus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so, but you know, yeah. Look upon this, look upon this caduceus, and you'll be healed. You right. Know? Well, <clears throat> the, even 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 the explanation by the church fathers, you'll note, is is really just kind of arguing in a circle. Yeah. So you know, you're ultimately left throughout all of this, George Ann, with what what really are we going to do with this metaphor? Transhumanism's doing one thing with it. Mm -hmm. This is why we spend so much time with it. The Yahwist religions are doing something else with it. This, you know, this basic cosmology has been there all along. Oh, yeah. All along. And it, it is the deep question. Well, how dare those people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. How dare them patent people? Oh my yeah. God, yo, gee, what? J just as a matter of curiosity, what would happen if we could successfully remove personhood from corporation from the corporate structure? Oh boy, you want to take that one? <laughs> well, that's the uh, the subject for a future book, isn't it? Oh, yeah, dear. <laughs> yeah, we do. We are seriously, George, and talking oh. about talking about doing a book on that precise topic. Um, I think probably it would be best at this point just to kind of let that question hover. <laughs> yeah, so. you can't even give us a little peek. It no, we really can't because we haven't. For one thing, we haven't really discussed it beyond a few very basic ideas oh, of, okay. of what we want to, you know, what we want to go. But um, okay, it it is a profound question. Yeah, and one percolating with us for a couple of years at least. Oh, oh boy, I, so <laughs> more than a couple of years. <laughs> I, I should say that the book idea has been percolating for a, a couple of years. Well, yeah, the book There's idea. The goes back to, uh, well, goes back to some of our earliest questions in theology that we oh, yeah. you know, were discussing. Yeah, we've been talking about that you know, as long as we've known each other. <laughs> well, 
that may have been among the first, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it really was, George Ann. It was, it was one of the first things that, that uh, Scott and I talked about. Wow. <laughs> we have many exciting things to look forward to with you two. <laughs> 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 oh, my gosh. Well, Scott DeHart, thank you very much for your participation in this uproarious conversation. And it was a pleasure. Thank you. Pardon? I said it was a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And Joseph P. Farrell, thank you very much. For, You're welcome, hon. For your participation. Uh, and, thanks for having us back. Oh, any time. This book, Transhumanism, A Grimoire of Alchemical Agendas, by Dr. Joseph P. Farrell and Dr. Scott D. Hart, is a must-read. Uh, can we get back together a few times on this book for interviews? Yes. Uh, fine by me, absolutely. Okay, well, you got it. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I know that the listeners love it. So, thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Let me, let me say one thing, if I may, George Ann. Yes. I, I hope everybody listening will help George Ann out with with some donations. Um, she's having to have cataract surgery, which is quite expensive. And um, she's been supporting this this show for many years out of her own pocket, so I hope everybody will chip in and, and help her out to get her eyes fixed. Um, Thank anyway, you, Joseph. You're welcome. Hon. And that pocket is a tiny pocket. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Yes, I know, hon. Yeah. I know it is. I, I know it is. And I want to thank everybody who have stepped up to the plate and made donations. Just blessings to you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you with all my heart. Thank you. So we will get back together with... All righty. Dr. Joseph P. Farrell and Scott D. Hart, and we will do another interview on transhumanism. So, good night, everybody. Good night.